But as the it is good to be back again. Here's that America leaves no doubt in one's mind that big America and that glorious place to come back to. He is a pioneer in aviation, a scientist. A great explorer challenges the hostile and the unknown. His is a lifetime of danger and adventure and of a search for knowledge. Admiral Rich Bird, and this is his bio. Mike Wallace, and this is Biography. Our story, Admiral Richard E. Byrd. We live in an age when a handful of men will begin to ex that are now just points of light in the distant sky. These astronauts are the descendants of men who walked or sailed or flew into the unknown regions of our own planet Earth. Admiral Richard E. Byrd was one of these pioneers. His challenge rested in the frozen wastelands of this globe. Antarctica, a barren world of eternal cold. Vast, white, silent. But Richard Evelyn Byrd called this nature's most sublime work of art. I like the endless reaches of wind-rippled snow, he said. I like the stark peaks and the awesome glaciers. I like the symbols of life's triumphs in a lifeless land. But most of all, said Richard Byrd, I like the challenge of it. He devoted most of his life to this challenge, to the lure of the unknown, the unexplored. It was the only kind of life he ever wanted. In 1904, Richard Byrd is the youngest cadet to enter VMI, the Virginia Military Institute. He is one of three sons from an old and respected Virginia family. He is such a self-reliant youngster that he's been permitted to trip around the world all by himself, age of 12. He becomes a midshipman at Annapolis in 1908 because the Navy offers excitement, travel, and adventure. The idea of exploring has already taken root in his mind. When young Richard Byrd hears that Peary's expedition has reached the North Pole, he admits to a feeling of disappointment. I wanted to be first, he says. Quarterback of the Navy football team. In a game against Princeton, his ankle is broken when he's tackled by half the Princeton line. His football career is over. Bird's leg is still not fully healed when he graduates in 1912, and it brings his Navy career temporarily to an end. Later, he writes, trained for seafaring, I was temperamentally disinclined for business, but the war saved me. World War I, and there's a critical need for experienced naval officers. Recalled to duty, Lieutenant Richard Byrd trains with the Navy's primitive air squadrons. From the moment I became a full-fledged Navy pilot, he says, my ambition was to make a career in aviation not merely in the sense of routine flying, but in the pioneering sense. It is not until well after the war, in 1926, that Richard Byrd sails from New York on his first attempt at pioneering. He sets out to be the first man ever to fly over the North Pole. You have started, says his father, a dangerous and inconsequential career. But aboard the Chantier, a decrepit merchant ship, Bird heads for Spitsbergen, 
a barren island off the tip of Norway, 800 miles from the North Pole. The Chantier cannot dock in the ice-choked harbor at Spitsbergen, but Bird refuses to turn back. He lashes together a crude raft in a risky attempt to float his plane to shore. As the back-breaking job begins, Bird receives word that Roald Amundsen, the famed polar explorer, is on his way to Spitsbergen with the dirigible Norge. Amundsen is going to race Bird to the North Pole. On May 6, 1926, the Norge arrives in Spitsbergen. The race is about to begin. In a spirit of friendly rivalry, Amundsen inspects the plane Bird will use. He is impressed with the planning. Polar exploration, he says, is a matter of details. This is no headless attempt. Bird has a real chance to beat me. The Norge, Amundsen says, will be ready in two or three days. Frantically now, Bird's crew packs a primitive landing strip out of the ice. There's no break for sleep, and meals are served by an improvised field kitchen. The Norge, meanwhile, is being loaded with supplies. It's the last step before Amundsen launches his flight. With Floyd Bennett as his pilot, Bird is now ready to risk the takeoff on specially built skis while carrying a heavy load of gasoline. If he gets off, Bird will try right now for the North Pole. Ahead are the endless reaches of polar ice and the goal that Richard Byrd had set for himself more than 20 years before. Even as he checks his instruments, Byrd is aware of what he calls the extraordinary exhilaration that comes to explorers seeing an area never before viewed by mortal eyes. Finally, at two minutes past nine o'clock, on May 9, 1926, the dream of a lifetime is realized. Richard Byrd is the first man to fly over the North Pole. Seeing the top of the world spread out beneath him is inspiring and frightening. We feel, he says, no larger than a pinpoint, as lonely as a tomb, as remote and detached as a star. Bird's arrival back at Spitsbergen starts an unrestrained celebration. One of the first to offer congratulations is Roald Amundsen. Bird's success at Spitsbergen convinces him that he can make a long-distance flight most people consider impossible. He tells Floyd Bennett, now we can fly the Atlantic. Sailing into New York Harbor, the Chantier is given a mighty welcome the newest hoe of the 1920s. Bird's wife, Marie, joins him at City Hall for the formal ceremonies. But even as the awards continue, Richard Bird is thinking about his next adventure the Atlantic flight. On April 20th, 1927, work is completed on the America. The plane finds himself involved in a race. His rivals are Clarence Chamberlain, an experienced aviator, and a young unknown pilot named Charles Lindbergh. They join Bird at Roosevelt Field on Long Island. Newsmen have built up the idea of a transatlantic derby and Bird is the favorite to win. It would be nice to be first, Bird admits, but that isn't the goal of this flight. He considers the crossing an experiment in the potential of modern aviation, and he begins a series of preliminary tests to see if the America can live up to expectations. Bird is pleased with the way the ship handles in the air, but as a landing is attempted,
miraculously, Bird escapes without being hurt, but Floyd Bennett is badly injured. Doctors say he will never fully recover from the effect of the crash. On May 20th, 1927, Bird offers young Charles Lindbergh the use of his specially built runway. Bird is on hand to wish Lucky Lindy happy landing. Even after Lindbergh has completed his historic flight, Bird continues to work on the American. He is relieved that it's no longer a race. He feels that multi-engine planes carrying a payload and passengers can cross the ocean, that the future of transoceanic aviation is on trial. On June 30th, 1927, the America carrying Bird and a three-man crew sets out to attempt an Atlantic crossing. More than 40 hours later, almost out of gas, the plane circles above a lighthouse at Vers sur mer on the coast of France. They have flown over Paris, but Le Bourget Airport is socked in by fog, and Bird has no choice but to try a forced landing near the darkened beach. The America is a total wreck, but the four men escape injury. Back home in New York City, he's greeted by the same kind of adulation showered on Charles Lindbergh. Says Bird, what I had been fortunate enough to accomplish was what each man, clerk, banker, or messenger boy, vicariously felt he had accomplished. The cheers, he said, are not so much for the man, but for the idea. At his home in Bayside, Long Island, he relaxes for the first time. He has a chance to be with his four children, and they paddle about in the same life raft that saved him and his crew at Versumer. He makes the most of these moments, but his mind is 3,000 miles away. Richard Bird has resolved to be the first man to fly over the South Pole. expedition sails for Attica in the fall of 1928. Richard Byrd now hopes to be the first man to fly over the South Pole. Man wants to know, he writes, and when he does not want to know, he ceases to be a man. On Christmas Day, 1928, the ship reaches the Ross Barrier, the towering edge of Antarctica. The expedition will have three airplanes and a variety of mechanized snow cruisers. But sled dogs are still the safest and most dependable means of transportation across the treacherous surface of the Antarctic. Working round the clock through what is the Antarctic summer, the explorers shape a small city out of the snow and ice. The survival of Byrd and his 41 men depends upon Byrd's preparation. Once winter sets in, they'll be sealed off in a frozen wasteland, unable to receive food, fuel, or vital pieces of equipment. Byrd christens the base Little America. Underground, they have built dormitories, dining rooms, the comforts of home. But, says Bird, we had all the privacy of goldfish. Through the sunless Antarctic winter, Bird makes plans for what will be the high point of the expedition, the flight over the South Pole. They have spent almost a year in Antarctica, and now the time has come. The first flight to the South Pole. Pilots Harold June and Bernd Falcon, 
and Ashley McKinley, the aerial photographer, load their equipment. On this flight, Bird will carry with him a stone taken from the grave of his close friend and loyal companion, Floyd Bennett, who died before this expedition began. Thanksgiving Day, 1929, brings ideal flying weather. The South Pole is still a thousand miles away, protected by the vast Queen Maud Mountains. Their jagged peaks reach as high as 10,000 feet. As they approach the mountain barrier, Bolchen signals to Bird that the plane is overloaded, that he cannot climb high enough to clear the range. Bird reluctantly jettisons a precious cargo of survival equipment. Slowly, the nose of the plane points up, and Bolchen fights to gain altitude. They are over the hump, and the door to the South Pole is open. At 1.14 p.m. on Thanksgiving Day, Richard Byrd and his crew reach the South Pole. The first time man has ever flown over this desolate and solitary point on our dropped mark the moment. Forty men share the glory, the exhilaration of success. Within a month, the expedition is ready to leave Antarctica. But Richard Byrd has resolved to return to continue exploring this forbidding continent. It is still the largest unknown area on the face of the Earth. Early in 1933, Admiral Byrd is ready again. On this expedition, we hope to fly across the South Pole into the mysterious land beyond to see what is there. There means an area down there, nearly as large as South America. We believe we will find something in that vast area that will be of value to mankind. The super-chilled air of Antarctica has acted as a giant ice box. Little America, buried under snow and ice, is preserved exactly as it was three years ago. Memories are reawakened, and some old friendships are renewed. decides to spend the winter alone at an advanced base, a weather station 125 miles away from Little America. He knows that the Antarctic night and the dangerous terrains... Life in this spot, he writes, resembles life on a dark, dead, and bitterly cold planet. At first, Bird enjoys the experience of being alone and the work he is doing. But he is unaware that fumes from a faulty stove are poisoning the air inside the shack and slowly but surely killing him. The carbon monoxide and the bitter cold make him weak, almost helpless. He cannot prepare food for himself, cannot keep the shack heated. He refuses to ask for help and hides his serious condition from the men at Little America. However, his radio communications with the base become erratic and garbled. Realizing that Bird is in trouble, his men organize a rescue party. They set out through the Antarctic to reach Bird's tiny shack. 
The darkness, the hidden crevasses, the bone-chilling cold make the 120-mile trip an infinity of hardship. After days of incredible, they reaches the hut. They radio saying, Bird is haggard, hollow-cheeked, but thankfully he is alive. Returning to Little America, says Bird, is like returning to life. To mingle once more with men is like a new existence. I feel as if I have been born again. The year and the work are done. He will return to Antarctica again and again and continue to search out the secrets locked beneath ages of ice and snow. It is by far the most fertile field for science left in the world. And in the years to come, Antarctica is going to be of strategic value. As far as I'm concerned, I'll be delighted to get back and see again my old friends, the penguins. World War II abruptly halts plans for still another expedition to the Antarctic, Admiral South Pacific. His years of experience with problems of supply are invaluable, and he masterminds the logistic support of the massive invasions of Guadalcanal and Okinawa. After the war, in 1946, a U.S. Navy task force heads for Antarctica, the largest scientific assault ever made on that vast continent. A new, improved technology developed during World War II is now applied to exploration. The honor of leading this expedition belongs to Admiral Richard Byrd. It is a gratifying experience for this 58-year-old explorer, who in the past had to raise his own funds for exploration, and who now has the resources of the United States Navy at his command but others will continue the work that Richard Byrd began. Significantly, it is through Richard Byrd's efforts that the Treaty of Antarctica has been signed. It is a unique agreement that opens the continent for exploration and research by scientists of every nation in the world. In 1955, two years before his death, Admiral Richard Byrd departs on his fifth and last expedition to the Antarctic. But it's not simply an unknown continent or a distant ocean that lures adventurers like Richard Byrd. As he put it, here is a door ajar through which one may escape from the noise and chaos of civilization into the solace and harmony of the cosmos and for a moment be part of it. Admiral Richard Byrd explored more uncharted land than any other man in history. He was a man of action, but he was a man of thought as well. An explorer and a scientist, an adventurer and a philosopher, a complete man. One of the men in history who had to lead the way. Mike Wallace for Biography.